Welcome to the lecture for chapter 10. We're going to continue to explore this evolution in American identity that was taking place in the early 19th century, really in the first half of the 1800s, an evolution that was born out of the American Revolution and then really catalyzed even further by the War of 1812. We saw the market revolution unfolding in chapter nine and all of the changes that that brought. And that was really spurred by the War of 1812 and the embargo against British goods. That's what spurred American industry, American manufacturing. And so American identity, American ideas of freedom started to become more and more closely associated with economic mobility. Well, in chapter 10, we're going to see that that new association of, of freedom with economic mobility and economic opportunity is going to challenge the idea of how big and how active the federal government should be. If the federal government is in charge of trade and commerce, then how active should the government be in promoting economic development and economic opportunity for its citizens? And that's going to bring up some policy issues like protective tariffs which would be implemented to uh, continue to build up American manufacturing at home so that America had a greater sense of self-reliance and wasn't as dependent on Great Britain. Other policies would be uh, internal improvements, you know, really government-sponsored or publicly funded uh, improvements to roads, uh, railroads, canals, uh, transportation in general to allow more intrastate commerce. Um, and then also the second bank of the United States is going to become a major issue um, for a lot of Americans. And, uh, and we'll talk about that in more depth as well. But the biggest theme that we're going to look at in chapter 10 is the expansion of democracy, particularly during the age of Jackson, being Andrew Jackson. Because what we see, especially as the Northeast received an influx of immigrants and cities became more populous. We start to have this urban sprawl in certain parts of the Northeast and wage labor started to replace artisanship. What we see is that more and more wage earning Americans that own very little property are pushing for their right to participate in politics. Now, the reason why that's important is because previously it was thought that you needed to have some sort of vested interest to participate in politics. If you wanted to vote, you had to have something at stake, right? And so you needed to own some property or have an estate worth over a certain value um, dependent upon the states and the locales. You, you would have to have some sort of vested interest to participate in politics. But as we start to see more and more wage earners be excluded because they don't own property, they're going to push for inclusion. And we start to see uh, during the toward the mid 1800s, we start to see more and more states dropping property qualifications from who has access to the vote. But here's the, the issue that we see unfold. While we see this huge expansion in the boundaries of freedom for white males who are now able to vote regardless of their economic status, we see a further solidification based on gender and race, where now the exclusion isn't based on economic status or social class. Now it's based on whether you're white or not, whether you're a man or not. And so more and more white males begin to vote. And in that regard, democracy is expanding. But the exclusion uh, of those who aren't given access to political participation is further solidified during this time as well. So we're going to look at all of these things unfolding during the first half of the 1800s. We'll be splitting this lecture of chapter 10 into five different sections, the triumph of democracy, Nationalism and its discontents, Nation, Section, and Party, The Age of Jackson, and The Bank War and After. So we'll start with the first section, The Triumph of Democracy, and the focus question here is, what were the social bases for the flourishing democracy of the early mid-19th century? One basis of political democracy in this period was the challenge to property qualifications for voting. It began in the American Revolution, but culminated in the early 19th century. 
After the revolution, no new state required property ownership to vote. And in older states, constitutional conventions in the 1820s and 1830s abolished property qualifications, partly because the growing number of wage earners who did not own much property demanded the vote. In the South, however, where large slave owners dominated politics and distrusted mass democracy, property requirements were eliminated only gradually and disappeared quite late by 1860. The personal independence required of the citizen was henceforth located not in owning property, but in owning oneself, a reflection of this period's individualism. The single exception to this democratizing trend was Rhode Island, which required voters to own considerable real estate or pay a certain amount of rent. The state was a center of factory production, and many wage earners could not vote. In 1841, reformers met at a People's Convention and drafted a new state constitution that gave the vote to all adult men and stripped it from blacks. When the convention extra-legally ratified the constitution and inaugurated Thomas Dorr, a lawyer, as governor, President John Tyler dispatched federal troops to the state and the movement collapsed. The Dorr War demonstrated the passions aroused by exclusion of any white men from voting, and the legislature soon eliminated property qualifications for native-born men, both black and white. It was retained for immigrants until 1888. By 1840, more than 90% of adult white men could vote. By then, America had a vibrant democratic system that engaged massive numbers of citizens. Lacking traditional bases of nationality, such as ethnic or religious unity, democratic political institutions imparted a sense of identity to Americans. Alexis de Tocqueville, a French writer who visited the United States in the early 1830s, wrote of this political culture in his classic book, Democracy in America. As an aristocrat, Tocqueville disliked democracy. But his key insight was that democracy was more than just voting or political institutions. Democracy to Tocqueville was a culture that encouraged individual initiative, belief in equality, and a public sphere with numerous voluntary organizations that wanted to improve society. Democracy was new. The idea that sovereignty resided in the mass of ordinary citizens was a departure in Western thought, which traditionally had viewed democracy as the road to anarchy. But in the United States, pressure from those originally excluded from political participation created a democracy for white men that triumphed in the age of Jackson. In America, the right to vote and participation in politics offered a sense of national identity. While democracy reinforced the sense of equality among those who belonged to the political nation, it deepened the divide separating them from those who did not. The market revolution and political democracy expanded the public sphere and the world of print. This information revolution was facilitated in part by the invention of the steam-powered printing press, which printed much more matter at far less cost. A new style of sensational journalism catered to a mass readership, which was soon created in newspapers with a total circulation higher than that of all Europe. Low postal rates and the growth of political parties also sparked the expansion of print and allowed newspapers to reach audiences far beyond their own locality. Labor organizations, reformers, and even Native American tribes printed their own alternative newspapers for the first time in American history, and the growth of print offered a new generation of women writers a venue for expression. As democratization expanded the number of people who participated in politics, it was necessary to define the boundaries of the political nation in terms of freedom and who could enjoy it. Antebellum American political life was both expansive and exclusive. Democracy absorbed native-born white men and white immigrants, but established barriers to the participation of women and non-white men. As democracy triumphed, the grounds for political exclusion shifted from economic dependency to supposed natural incapacity. Gender and racial differences were seen as part of a single, natural hierarchy of innate endowments. A natural boundary was not at all exclusive, many argued, and women and non-whites were deemed lacking in qualities necessary for democracy and self-government. 
While freedom for white men involved a process of personal transformation, of developing their potential to the fullest extent, democracy's limits rested on the idea that the character and abilities of non-whites and women were fixed by nature. And the world of politics was partly defined against the feminine sphere of the home. Freedom in the public sphere in no way required freedom in the private sphere. In a nation obsessed with equality, democracy was more and more associated with whiteness. While white Americans of all social classes dressed similarly and mixed in public, blacks were increasingly excluded from public life. Racist depictions of blacks in the culture became widespread. An ideology of racial superiority and inferiority with an allegedly scientific basis took root where it had never before existed. After 1800, every state admitted to the Union, except for Maine, limited voting rights to white males only. By 1860, blacks could vote on the same basis as whites in only five New England states, which had only 4% of the nation's free black population. Whites of the Revolutionary Era had considered blacks as potential members of the body politic, but in the 19th century, membership in the political nation was increasingly demarcated by race. No blacks had full equality before the law, and they were barred from schools, militias, and other public institutions. In effect, race replaced class as the boundary between American men with political freedom and those without, a process that incorporated many white immigrants into American democracy. 